Hello and welcome back to the Smoke Room. We'll be continuing where we left off in Murdoch's route. And if you recall, they were having a little heart-to-heart -heart talk in the changing room. Well, they were supposed to be fitted for their um, tuxedos. For um, Murdoch's sister and Jim, I think that's his name, uh, wedding. And in it, Murdoch was basically confessing to Sam that I guess to some extent he's fallen for Sam. And he kind of wishes that their whole relationship was an actual relationship and not something of a of a money thing. And uh, he basically confessed to Sam that um, Murdoch has been having to sleep with Jim in order to keep him interested. And that it's kind of known to the family, or at least the sister, the older sister who's going to marry the guy. Uh, because she basically uh, told Jim, her fiancé, that, hey, we can swing here too, and, you know, my brother is probably in it, or into it, or whatever. And Murdoch wanting to be, wanting to keep the family happy, you know, just went, went on with it. Obviously, Sam was not okay with it either. Not only that, but I believe Murdoch was going to have a little bit of a crying fit. But then all of a sudden he like recomposed himself, which I know all too well because I tend to do that too. And Sam was like, like, what are you doing? Like, allow yourself to feel these feelings. And yeah. So, well, let's see what happens. What could it possibly be? I think I have a guess. Say what you mean. I heard the sheriff talking about it in his office after a shoot. With his friend. The Big Badger. He said you were walking around with a head injury. He looks behind his shoulder. About a month ago, coming from the mines. So that's why I haven't seen Nikolai come around the hip yet. I guess I wouldn't either. So what? And you talk about it like you've been there? I used to work there. Recently? And just how many people have heard them talking about that, you think? He sighs and shakes his head. I don't know. I don't think it was more than the three of us. Though I wasn't exactly supposed to be listening. His deputy might know as well. But I can't be sure. So what will you do now? Whatever you need me to do, I suppose. I stare at him for a while. I laugh. Whatever I need, huh? You and the sheriff and the man who I thought was my best friend are burning the midnight oil to rush me to the gallows, and you're gonna ask me what I need? That's a confession, Sam? No. I feel my throat tighten. Maybe. His expression is impossible to read now. You're saying all sorts of crazy things. Making me confused. I'm not admitting to anything. But let's say, what if that was a confession? What then? He swallows a spit. Well then, I think you did it. And then what? What next? The fox shrugged. Nothing. Why nothing? Why whatever I need? That don't make any damn sense. Because a noose isn't justice. What? He's wringing his paws and curls his lips. I've seen plenty of murderers walk free with the right excuse. Or just by happening to know the right people. So I meant what I said. A noose isn't justice. It's just a long tether to a dark, heavy weight. A weight that all people have. A weight we want to cut loose and soar away from. Higher. Free. 
leaving all the ugliness of the earth behind us on the floor in a heap for the ants to find. Except we never leave it behind, Sam. We just... Take it with us. Nobody can shake off the bugs eating them up every time a platform falls. I shake my head. Maybe sometimes people just want relief. They just want relief from... I stutter over my words. Relief from the fear that took their lives from them. Now that's not a so crazy, is it? When that's the case, maybe not. But how many people calling for an execution knew that miner, though? Nick always did tell me he wasn't well-liked. I don't know. I do. It's not fear in the air I can smell. It's excitement. Excitement to drop the platform and hear the twang. Sort of like... A building tension. Like a package bursting at the seams. And so what? Where are you going with this? Where am I going with this? I want to help you. Help me? I laugh. Help me? The how is the first question. What exactly can you do? You're trapped as much as me. The why is a second question. Why do you want to help me? What's really in it for you? He let out a squeaky whine. Is it because I'm easy to look at? Yes. Is it because I make you feel good? Yes. But you don't know me. And I never will if you're dead. I stopped to catch my breath. Since the first time that I found out about you, I was a bit jealous. Jealous? Of me? Are you stupid? Well, maybe. I thought you had a life that I wanted. The nightlife. The glamorous parties. Using your own body to give and get pleasure. People paying money to love you when I couldn't even get that for free had my head spinning. So yeah, for a few years I wanted to be you. Getting by on whatever intimacy I could find at bars and dances. I shake my head. Well, I'm sorry that you had it all wrong. But listen. I should be fine. I need you to forget everything you think you know. You know full well that this one remembers all sorts of things. And never, ever share it. And you know he talks too much. O okay. He'll sell you out for the smallest scrap of love. I promise I will never bring this up again. All they have to do is spread their legs. Because that's all anybody needs to buy his soul. So give to him the greatest love he'll ever know. Give him the love that will close his eyes forever. Good. He'll probably do it for himself if you ask him to. Shut the hell up! Murdoch recoils away from me. His eyes were wide and red. He looked a lot like his little brother right now. The one from the photograph at his house. A small, scared thing. I said I promise I won't say anything. Was it you? Was that voice again? It's a crazy thing to tell somebody, but somehow, he looks relieved. Is there something the matter back there? Uh, right as rain. Son of a bitch is just poking fun of how stupid I look in formal wear. Ain't that right? There's too much of this brute to cover. I know he's trying to sound cheeky, but the delivery of that statement is flat. 
Do not hesitate to call for assistance. His voice sounds tense. He doesn't want us back here much longer. Murdoch picks up on that too. Why don't we do what we came here to do? And get dressed for the parts that we are meant to play. He buttons each button and buckles each clasp as he stares into the mirror watching out of the corner of his eye, quite tentatively. Then he spins around. How do I look? Just fine. I think you look just fine. Thank you. If there's one thing that I've been told I always do well, it's clean up nicely. They weren't lying. You look good too. You always think I look good. You've pinned me again. Well... Only twice. Factually speaking. You're keeping count? I just meant that it's easy. He hums. Then maybe I should make it harder. He chuckles. But seriously. In the short time that I've known you, I've only dragged you into tedious obligations and miserable revelations. So let me share something a little fun that I learned about recently. I'm listening. You know that weightless feeling that people get when they drift into deep water? Yeah. My younger sister tells me that being in space is supposed to be a lot like that. Except it's everywhere, all the time. All the time? And you don't even have to get wet. It's like you're swimming in nothing, and it's impossible to feel heavy. You can do a backflip without trying. Or you could just jump into the air without ever falling back down. That's impossible. I know it sounds impossible, but I promise it's all true. I guess I'll just have to go into space and find out for myself. I guess so. Do you think that'll ever be possible? I don't know. I sometimes hear that we're getting pretty close. But if it were possible, would you be brave enough to go? Sure. Even if that meant the chance of you burning to a crisp in the Earth's atmosphere? I'd go pretty much anywhere if it meant getting away from here. What about you? Hmm. Well, like I told you once before, I used to travel a lot of places when I was little. But nobody's ever asked me that as an adult. Not even your roommate? No. He keeps bragging about all the places that he'll go and the people that he'll see when he saves up enough money to leave. But he has family all over the place. Mine is here. But what if you could go to outer space? Well, what if I could? Would you go? I'm afraid that I would find it a very lonely place. Despite what my favorite books and picture shows suggest, there's probably not much to find there. It's likely just a long, winding landscape of endless rock and dust. With nobody there to talk to. Sounds like here. At least there's music here. But you could fly there. I'd probably give up my ability to walk if I had to choose between that and people to talk to. I can't relate. I'm starting to wish you could. Do you really mean that? Well, yeah. My legs are too handy. Is that so? Sure is. Because you don't have to walk if I'm the one pinning you. He gives me an absurd expression and breaks out into laughter. The examples are extreme, that's fair. Can I offer any assistance? We both jump from the attendant's shout over the other side of the curtained wall. Almost finished. The fits are nearly perfect. Murdoch lowered his voice. 
Considering I've bought clothes here for my entire life, I hope they know my size by now. Does the size fit me? Mostly. The pants could use a bit of hemming. Well, I don't want to stay here for much longer. A friend could hand these for me. The people here will do it for you if you ask. Nah. I don't care much for the mood of this place. Why don't you get the changes that you need and I'll go get Jim. If you must. I feel a little bad leaving Murdoch after, well, learning all of that. But I have questions for his future brother-in-law. And I ain't too keen to have Murdoch see what I'm like if I'm going to get awfully angry. I remember Jim mentioned that he'd be at the pawn shop. I know where that is. All too well, in fact. I swapped so many coins and tickets and keepsakes for those damn double eagles. The bell of the door jingles when I walk through. I don't see anybody at the cash register, but I do see the black and white tail of the marbled fox as he stoops over a glass display case. He doesn't seem too bothered or preoccupied with the notion that somebody just entered the store. I fantasize about smashing his head into the case for a moment. The thing holding me back most is all the property damage. Finished up the suit fitting. He doesn't look up, still focused on the casing. A bit quick for a fitting. There wasn't much work to be done. The lie comes out a bit quick and Jim quirks an eyebrow. Don't be so hasty. You're a bit wider and taller than most folks in town. He looks me up and down. Or out of town. You look smart with the right fit. Might come in handy for somebody in your position even after the ceremony. I do catch his drift. You like the views, so to speak. I do. Even if I have a bad habit of ruining them. This one does like making his messes. Good. Stay comfortable, Jim. I look down at the display case and see a large variety of rings in the display case. You seem like you're in a bit of a mess yourself. What are you hunting? You didn't strike me as a nosy type. I smile. Oh, I'm very nosy. Don't bother telling me if it's boring, though. He smiles back. I'm afraid it is. A big white polar bear comes lumbering from out behind the back. I've talked to him plenty, but never really got around to asking his name. He's all business. Sorry, kid. No diamonds in stock the size you want. Jim cursed under his breath. Of course there aren't. Then what do you have? Here's the ones that will fit the inlay. Flint? Citrine? He takes a step forward, stooping over the boxes and inspecting them with his eyes. The cuts could be better but I'll take that one. The third citrine from the left. It won't cost you much. Of course it won't. We're practically bathing in citrine. He sighs deeply. It will match my fiance's eyes and remind her of home. That should work, I think. I'll get it ready then. The polar bear lumbers to the back of the store again. Good. Holly's ring, huh? Clearly. Cutting it a bit close for something less than a week away, you think? He shrugs. The only thing that matters is that it doesn't look cheap. It's just a token. Of your marriage? Traditionally speaking. Though I don't care a whit for tradition. True enough. I lower my voice. I suppose it's not very traditional to break into your fiancé's brother. His eyes widen, and then he looks around. Then he laughs as he speaks. Best not to discuss any dalliances here. Be they true or flights of fancy. It's only us here. We're no strangers to sharing secrets. You could say that we have a 
kinship of sorts. He looks a little pale, looking around. Oh, do we? Well, I could get on my knees and beg you to agree. Now he's taking a deep breath. But of course, what I'm really talking about is that I've plowed him too. Ah. Jin's scowl turns into a smirk. Well, what can I say? The whole family seems to love me. Though I suppose the brother goes to the extra mile when he needs an itch scratched. He sure is talking about this casually. Though I have to say, he should probably pace himself. Like it's not a big deal. He asks quite a bit. Oh, does he? I have to wonder if that's true. Though, from his tone and the sheer flippancy of his statements, I'm inclined to believe him. I guess I don't really know what Jim knows. Considering the precariousness of the whole situation, I suppose it's possible Jim doesn't know. Am I really the only one Murdoch has ever told about this situation? It's possible he could have told Ralph. No, it isn't. He'd blow it up. I don't feel like I need to knock Jim's teeth out anymore. But I'm still angry. And I'm not sure who I should direct it at. The doorbell rings again and I'll have to see who enters. Is everybody finished up here? Jim pulls out a silver pocket watch and flips open the clasp. As much as I'd like to be, for now. My work requires me in 15 minutes. Oh, does it? Then I suppose with that we should be on our way as well. Back to the store for us, Sam. Right. He gives us a stiff nod. Till the next time, gentlemen. I follow Murdoch as he heads to the doorway. Jim is looking at his backside with a sideways glance. Then turns back to the jewelry case. Telling by how busy things are getting outside, I can guess it's close to noon. You didn't say anything to make him uncomfortable, did you, Sam? Not as uncomfortable as I would have liked to, no. He doesn't strike me as somebody easy to make uncomfortable. He puts his arm in front of me to stop me from walking as a loud and noisy wagon passes us by. Are you dodging my question? I feel my left whisker twitch. I did say some things. Mostly just that I know he's having a go at you. But don't worry. It rolled right off of him. And what did that accomplish? Not much, I don't think. But I saw I put some fear in him. Sometimes men need a little fear when they take things too lightly. And sometimes a little fear can make things worse. I rub my nose. Well, sorry if it does. You're welcome if it doesn't. Well... I'm sure he was bound to ask if you knew eventually. Let's not linger on it. I don't think I should mention anything about the ring. The fact that he was buying it as late as he was isn't a comfortable sign. I don't think Murdoch needs anything else to feel anxious about. By the time we get back to the store, we were surprised to see a sign out in the front door. Temporarily closed back in an hour? That doesn't seem normal. It isn't. Pod doesn't close at lunchtime, typically. He pulls out a key from his pocket and fiddles with the lock. The cool air in the dark store is a nice reprieve from the heat. As we walk close to the cash register, I expect to hear Ralph in the back room cursing while he works. As I certainly do. But I also hear another voice. A familiar voice. You sure you haven't seen him? Him? Who's him? The voice inside of my head is laughing. Not today, Sheriff. You might find him if you check the north of Lake Emma, like we told you to. Don't get saucy with me. We did check the lake. 
there was nothing down there aside from the defunct mining tunnel. Try checking the bottom of it. I guarantee you'll find somebody. Maybe more. My deputy's a damn otter. If there was something down there, he'd surely seen it. With eyes as wide apart as his, I could probably mow down half of downtown in front of him and he'd miss it. Not one bit of that now. Focus. Tell me where you think his routine would take him on a typical day like this. There's an edge to his tone. The slow slur in his speech from a few nights ago is gone. Will's back to the old Will that I know, the one who picks out a single word from a sentence and chases it all the way to its hiding place in your thoughts. I don't like the sound of this conversation. Neither does Murdoch by the look on his face. His expression tells me that I should hide, and I agree with it. And I'd be able to follow through with his plan if it wasn't for the man that I just ran into. Murdoch's father. Oh, there he is! Out here, Sheriff Adler! He's here! He's here! There was something sharp and shrill in this man's voice that I can hear now that I didn't before. A shaky kind of gleefulness that you might expect to hear from a man who had misplaced blackmail of a rival, but just found it underneath his couch cushions. It's such a quick and sudden burst of energy from an otherwise aloof old man that it takes me off guard. The door to the pharmacy opens and William walks out with a surprised look on his face. That was quick. Good. Now I don't have to chase you down. Looks more put together than how he looked a couple of nights ago, but the bags under his eyes are much worse. Sure, Sheriff. The fur on the back of my neck is prickling. What do you need? Just your cooperation. He turned to Mr. Burns. Is there a back room that I could use that isn't stinking up the air with chemicals? I feel like I'm practically swimming on the fumes. Of course. The old fox opens his mouth like he was about to say something, then closes it again. Almost like he had confused himself. I can show you where that is. Right, he can do that. He stroked his chin and then jerked his head towards a hallway. Then he glared at Murdoch. Good, we can reopen before we lose all the luncheon crowd. Handle this. Of course. The room isn't far. He walked me and the sheriff down the narrow hall. It would be stupid as hell to make a run for it now. But I still think about it. Right then. I have a few points to cover. I would have asked sooner, but my hands were tied. Ask away. Okay. Sure, Sheriff. What were you up to about a month ago when you received that head injury, walking back from the mines? That was a while ago, Will. Hard to forget an assault, though, ain't it? You had a head injury, no? Me and Will both look at Murdoch. You a doctor all of a sudden, Fox? Well, no, but I had a concussion before. Since when? Since I was a teenager. It was one of the worst days of my life, and I don't remember most of it. Even the parts that I was probably awake for. Well, he was well enough to walk all the way home. Nick helped me back, actually. I know. He says the line with confidence, but now he doesn't look so sure of what he's looking for. He's the one who told me about this. He said something about attacking me from my work, but it's still a bit fuzzy. Are you saying Nick saw who attacked you? Maybe? I feel a pang of guilt. This puts the suspicion more on Nick than on myself. Though I can't feel that bad about it if he told Will before talking to me about it again. I can't be sure though. You don't remember anything about who attacked you? Well, I know I was from behind. Because it was. And I couldn't see his face. Because he snuffed out the lights. But 
You say that it was a he. There's an edge in his tone. Unless James is hiring women to work in the mines? And why were you at the mines? Must have been seeing a client. Just a client? They come and go and I can't remember them all. Will's eyes flick to Murdoch when I say client and I catch some hint of concern, but Murdoch nods. Will sighs. Though I might have been visiting Nick. I can't really say. Wish I could. Will pulls out a notebook from his pocket and scrawls a few things down. Well, that about sums up things on my end. And? And what? Why are you here in the first place? You sound pretty urgent. Mr. Burns asked me over. He did? Yes, indeedy. Said staff around the store were acting peculiar. Then you were one of the folks he name-dropped. And then I remembered we had unfinished business to take care of. Fuck's sake, Will. Don't you click your sandpaper tongue at me. Sandpaper? I'm still mostly in the dark with respect to all of the damn incidents occurring as of late. Either of you want to fill me in on anything or what? I developed the photos for you, but over half of them have been corrupted. Over half? I thought I corrupted just the one. Well, that's just peaches. But we did see what looked like somebody assaulting and dumping a body down by the lake. I know. I told you that we looked. So, if there's nothing there, then either the bodies are well hidden or the lake is carrying them away. If there's bodies there at all, sure. I assure you that there's somebody down there if you know how to look for it. Bodies that get swept away tend to float, so something might come up. But if we sweep the shoreline for months and there's still a killer out there, then I'd rather our efforts were spent on stopping him before he makes another corpse. Or her. William rolls his eyes. You've been spending too much time with your sisters. Predators in these cases are almost always men. You think it's a predator? Truth be told, I don't think it's just one killer. And that makes it messy for me because it means that I can't pare the events down to a single motive like lust or greed or desperation. So maybe you're right, and one of them is running around with a skirt. I just don't think it's as likely, considering the usual fare of the tragic events that I investigate. He trails off as he glances at the two of us. So this isn't related to anything we've been talking about. But do I have this right? He fixes his eyes on Murdoch and jerks his head to me. Is he working for you now? It's just part time. I need the money. And how exactly did this proposition come to pass? Don't recall seeing any wanted flyers when I passed by. The last time I saw you two together before the night visit to my office was at the hip. I thought it was strange at first, but now I think I get it. He smirked. Mr. Burns. I recall you telling me once that you were above paying for something that you could get for free. What changed? I think he's trying to sound playful. But it sounded more like he's suspicious. Murdoch merely shrugged. He expressed honest interest in honest work. So I put the offer on the table and he took it. Will nods and grunts out a one-note laugh. Honest work, huh? Your daddy seems convinced that's the case, at least. Let's hope it stays that way. He walks to the door and puts his paw on the handle. But before he turns it, he spins around. But if it doesn't, and what I think is going on is going on, then maybe Sam could teach you a thing or two about his profession. 
He gives Murdoch a slow look up and down. I could work off some extra steam. Seems like it could be your forte. If there's anything important for me to know, I'll be in touch. Then he slipped through the door and shut it softly behind him. We wait and listen by the door. Was there anything amiss, Sheriff? Not to my judgment, no. Thank God. I'll leave you to that. I really don't like being around Murdoch's father. Seems like one moment he's shaking your hand, thanking you for blessing the ground you walk on. The next moment, it's like you're a soldier caught behind enemy lines. If I didn't know any better, I think that's the difference in his relationship between a customer and an employee. But it just seems like sometimes he genuinely can't tell the difference at any given time. It's completely unpredictable. Murdoch scratched the back of his head. So, Sam? Yes, Murdoch? Was he being a prick or was he offering to buy me? Probably both. I tilt my head and shrug. Pays well. I don't need the money. But it sounded like you were thinking about it. He puts his hands in his pockets. Well... Might be exciting. I smirk at him. It is. He sighs and shakes his head. He'd probably respect me less if I took him up on anything. So let him respect you less. That's weird. That's business. Not really. Because I still respect you more than anybody I know. I whistle. That's so. I expect him to blush or get bashful, but he just nods his head slowly. I think it is. But anyway. We have a lot of work to do today. I saw the film delivery inbox and I think we should clear it out as fast as possible. Do you really need me in the red room? I'd rather just clean or take stock of the merchandise or do some heavy lifting. It would help. There's going to be an unbelievable amount of photography work for the parties and the wedding. I agreed to help him, but I don't see the point of me being in there. Something bad happened last time, and it'll probably happen this time too. I don't like this room. But I do what he says. He goes through the process again with me. Just making sure it all sticks. Do you remember dilutions? Oh god. Uh, no. That's okay. Let's go through it again. Fuck. I have myself a strong concentration of developing fluid. I have a hundred milliliters of strong developing solution poured from a jar. I want to dilute this solution by making it half a quarter the strength of its original solution. If adding a hundred milliliters of water to the solution makes it half as strong, how many 100 milliliter additions do I need to add to make it half a quarter's strength in concentration? Uh... Three hundred? Beautiful! It's just a lucky guess. Uh-huh. And I just suck you off for the nutritional benefit. What? What? Let's move along. I don't think I ever told you about overdevelopment. Not that I recall. Well, when you expose your photograph to the light capturing chemicals for too long, eventually it captures too much light and the image gets completely ruined. So it's always something that you want to avoid doing. Well... Not necessarily. Sometimes you might find photographs that you don't want to develop. But you have to give them the right amount of photo counts in their reel. 
so you've ruined stuff on purpose before. I'll admit it. Stuff like what? Mostly the stuff I don't think I should be seeing. Or anybody should be seeing. Stuff like what? We occasionally get compromising pictures of sleeping women taken without their permission. And there are more pictures of unmasked hangings than I would like. But any images that show a pickaxe wound, perchance, could spend some time in the developer. He plucks a photo from a clothespin on a string and hands it to me. It's a picture of somebody's wound. I know this wound. I feel my tongue getting dry. Put it in the first tray. He means the light gray one, full of developer. I drop it into the container and watch the image get drenched in fluid, darkening it, murking out everything until it's completely dark. The image is gone, but the picture count is not. How does it get so dark? It's the light. There's so much information in the light that it can't capture all its subtleties and intricacies. So, it's all lost in the details. He's staring down at the image in the tray. His voice sounds strange. Strained. Usually darkness is what we ascribe to the occlusion or the distortion of what's really there. But it's light that does it, really. Warping through glass, bending through water, splintering through stones. Traveling through great distances in from outer space to power our plants, which we put in our bodies. Light comes to warm us, to graze us, to travel through us. He's muttering now. Some visible, mostly invisible. I hope you're enjoying this conversation you're having with yourself. He blinks as if he's suddenly a lot more aware of his surroundings. Right. Right. He tightens his lips. Then he chuckles. Usually when I go on about these things, Dahlia interjects with thoughts of her own. He waves his paw in the air. Usually rebuttals. He smiles. Sound ones. I wonder if I should tell him that how he was talking there was the first time he's reminded me of his father. But that's too cruel to say. Even if I think it's true. At least for him, it's more of a passing thing than a constant. I want to talk about something else right now. I look at some of the pinned photos on the wall. It dawns on me that a lot of these photos in this room belong to the Burns family. I see a much younger Dahlia on a stage in front of a microphone. There's one of Mr. and Mrs. Burns eating cake, perhaps from an anniversary. A teenage Holly is smiling from a typewriter. You mentioned today that you had a concussion once. Oh, I certainly did. There's Holly blowing out candles on a birthday cake. It was horrible. Had headaches for weeks. Weird that there aren't many pictures of Murdoch here. Still do, on occasion. Oh, there's one. How'd it happen? I was a teenager. It happened during the summer. All I remember is that it was a fishing trip. Like this one? Murdoch walks towards me and stares over my shoulder, then grunts. How did that get here? Anyways, no, not like that one. That's a happy memory. Me and Ralph were teaching Seamus how to prevent his line from snapping. I didn't know Ralph could be even skinnier. Yeah, I'm surprised none of the bigger catfish pulled him in. The fish and Emma were a lot bigger back then. Or maybe it was just us who got bigger. He smiles a bit and then it turns into a frown. I miss him. You said, he drowned, right? We think so. You think so? 
He leaned against the countertop and shifted his weight from his left foot to his right. He and some of his friends stowed away on a steamboat they weren't supposed to be on during the 4th of July. Was he stupid? Murdoch glares at me. He was eight. Sorry. They were going to set off some fireworks Ralph made for them from the lake. One of his friends said that the boat got rocky. That he tripped and fell and took a tumble off the side. But not before his arm got caught in the wheel. Shit. They found his paw. Just none of the rest of him. Sometimes, I try to think that he passed out and died of shock rather than him being awake when his lungs collapsed. But I'd like to remember him like this instead. It's the first week of summer. Honeysuckles and huckleberries are taking over the hillside, leaving the air smelling sticky and sweet. Campfire smoke is in the air too. And pulpy pine wood and sharp nettles. Slimy fish skin too, but the catfish were good to eat when you didn't want to go home for supper, or so the struggle was worth it. I wonder how he'd remember himself if we were here today. Probably envious of an age where fishing weren't as boring as watching paint dry. He smirks. Fishing is only as interesting as a company you bring. I cross my arms. You said before that you think that whatever is happening here has something to do with it, don't you? He grabs another blackened picture from the developing tray with tongs. I do. Well, you never explained why. Maybe it's just an unhappy coincidence? I got my concussion on the same day, Sam. I don't think that was a coincidence. You really don't remember what happened? Murdoch puts down his tongs and stares at the wall, like he's deep in thought. No. And don't insinuate that I'm lying. And if I didn't think that I could be honest with you, Sam, I wouldn't have brought you here. Well, I don't like thinking about what happened to me. But I remember it. Then, we had different experiences. On occasion, I try to remember what happened to me. Little pieces come and go, but there's never enough for a coherent picture. Might I inquire about those little pieces if I may be so bold? It's a fair thing to ask. I already know too much about you without even trying. He shrugged. Be as nosy as you like. Okay. What's anything at all that you can remember that day? He taps his chin and narrows his eyes. You ever seen a Boy Scout troop play Capture the Flag? Of course I have. That's the best game that I've ever played. Well, back then we used to call it Flag Raving. Me and Ralph and most of the kids in our neighborhood played it on Saturdays. But we moved this on to Tuesday because it was a holiday. And playing these big games made babysitting a lot more easy and tolerable. You were babysitting? My parents had dressed their best and went out of town. My mom said that it was Pa's most important business trip to date, so they were extra stern about me watching over the girls and Seamus. During one of the games, I went back home to get some water. All I remember is going through the front door, then feeling something hit the back of my head. Shit. Turns out we were being robbed. You're lucky you didn't die, you son of a bitch. I didn't feel that way when I woke up. The first thing that I heard after waking up was him telling me about the pieces of shame as they found. A gentle touch, that one. Murdoch shrugged again. He had a right to be forceful about that. Seamus was my responsibility. You were a child, and you were assaulted. I could say that. Or I could say that all of the worst possible things happened to align at the right time. I had to feel discouraged enough to go home. The robber had to feel desperate or envious enough to steal my family's things and knock me out before I could see him. Seamus had to feel bold enough to break the rules and hop onto a boat. 
and whatever else got into his head to mess around near the water wheel. So where were your sisters doing all of this? Holly snuck off to be with her friends. Dahlia was at an overnight finishing school. So how is that all your fault, and none of hers? I don't think that a chain like that can really be anybody's fault. At least, not anybody mortal. Or it could be. And you could just get a little angry at the people who contributed to the neglect. That wouldn't solve anything. Might ease the mental load. Doubtful. You know, sometimes I think I'm too selfish. Doing what feels good. Or who feels good. In spite of the values I was raised on. But then I talked to somebody like you, and I couldn't be envious one bit about what selfishness does to the mind of a man. No, sir. Not envious one bit. The first time that I saw you, I assumed that you couldn't be envious of anything at all. But after we spent the night together, you surprised me in a way that I didn't think you could. Oh, really? You showed me that you want stability, and that you don't have it. And so what? My family gives me that, Sam. You really think that's going to last? Well, why shouldn't it? Access to good food? My own income? A routine? A part to play in their busy lives, tending to their busy affairs? If they didn't need me, then they wouldn't make space for me. It's very simple. I understand what you're saying. I just think that it's a terrifying way to live. Now why is that? Because I don't trust your family one bit. But I do. There's something wrong with them, Murdoch. They're nuts. They're all brilliant, actually. They just aren't always kind. Now there's an understatement. If you don't trust them, can you at least trust me? I'll trust you if you face the possibility that they'll hurt you. What? Can you look me in the eye and tell me that they may not love you? Sam! Do you want my sympathy or do you want my trust? He looks me in the eye for a moment, then looks away. Well, I... Uh... Hmm... Tell me that they might not love you. He swallows. Alright. Alright what? What you said is possible. Finally. That's at least something. I never said that it's the complete truth. I just need to know that you can prepare for the worst. Preparation is one asset that I'm constantly valued for. Though I prefer not to meet the conditions of those circumstances. But what if you already have? Then I'm already prepared. I just don't think that it's the state of things. He didn't say much after the, throughout the day as we developed the rest of the photos. Nothing risque or gruesome, thankfully. Five o'clock came faster than I thought it would, but my head is dizzy without the cloying scent of fox and chemicals in the small, warm room. Looks like it's about time to head off and go home. He turns around and points at something hanging on the door handle. Make sure that you bring your suit with you. Oh, right. You're sure that you'll be able to get it hemmed? Because we can always go back to the tailor if we need. It's fine. I shut the door as I leave the red room. I wonder how much Cynthia will mind me asking for a favor. The hip looks a bit slow tonight. Then again, it's always slower on the weekdays. I walk upstairs and make my way to Cynthia's room, then knock on the door. A moment. The door opens. She rubs her eyes for a moment and then flinches. Oh, Sam. Aren't you white as a ghost and just as fleeting? Evening. Sorry, I haven't dropped by as of late. You look put upon. And don't trouble yourself with any worries. 
just hoping for a little bit of shut-eye before the late night shift. I'm not scandalized one bit. Though the madam might be if you let your queue keep growing. Do I have clients tonight? Cynthia plucks a notepad from her desk. Two, it looks like. Thirty minutes each. Nothing troublesome, then. All-nighters are always troublesome. I heard you found extra work, and I think that's great. You heard? It's hard to miss when you're working in one of the largest grocers on this side of town. I've been doing all sorts of odds and ends, I suppose. They even have me acting as an usher for a wedding. Well, if you're gonna usher, then you need to look presentable. Funny you should say that. I got a suit, but I need it hemmed. Think you could help me out? She crosses her arms and nodded. I can spare 30 minutes. Go get dressed. I'll be in your room in a bit. Though you really ought to wash if I'm going to be standing around and under you with a sewing needle. Doubly sew before you put on anything nice. She's getting more blunt. I'll go boil some water. Not gonna talk back, though, since she's doing me a favor. Now that I'm washed up and dressed, I crack the door open to let her know that I'm ready. She comes in holding a big leather bag in one paw and a spool of thread in the other. Oh. You didn't tell me that the suit was that fancy. So, I'll look fine? That's not what I said. The waist fit looks good, but the cuff of the pants needs adjustment. Shouldn't take too long if you hold still. Hold out your arms like an uppercase T and stand still. Why I gotta be standing? Cause we don't have a dummy, dummy. Now stuff it with a moaning and groaning and hold still. Ouch! What are you doing down there? Just marking the seams with a few pins. Pricked me. I'll fetch you a medic when we're through. Don't know if you'll make it, though. It was an instinct, Cynthia. Men make noises when they bleed. That's why y'all get squeamish around sanitary napkins? Oh, come on. She gives me a dismissive look. You know, it's the truth. Whatever. She shrugs and holds the spool between her teeth while threading the needle. Anything strange happened at the brothel during the daylight hours? Do you know about strange? Ouch! Mostly business as usual. Picked up a few more clients. Harlan keeps taking too many days off so that the madam is looking for another mixologist, but I think her standards are a bit too high. Though somebody did propose to Scarlet again, she say yes this time? She might. Oh, really? I know she wants kids. She said that he was one of her better customers. And she got a look in her eye. The one when she gets fan letters? The one where she's about to use the right coupon. Oh. Good for her, I reckon. Other foot. Ow! Fuck. Oh, and there is also some old trunk found in the walls. Big one? Barely. So, what was in it? I don't know. Sheriff Killjoy got his emits on it before any of us could see. Then Madam went along with letting him take it for some reason. Makes me wonder if there's other things that we could find hidden in the walls of this old building. It is good for hiding things. Nobody ever did find my coins back when I still had them. Just don't go tearing any holes in the walls. The wind gets cold at night. I'll be the first to let you know if I get the urge to tear anything down. Might start eating plaster if I get pregnant. I excuse me? Oh, you know. Some women get the urge to eat clay and dirt when they bear kids. Stop fucking with me. Even if you are interested, Sam, something tells me that we wouldn't be able to make any. Very funny. 
but no, the clay thing's real. The hell is wrong with canines? Vulpines? Whatever, close enough. You lose a lot of minerals when a small person or two is growing inside of you. And your body wants it all back. Thank you, Cynthia. No problem, Sam. She stands up in front of me. Wrists. I flap them at her. She gives me a look. Front and center. I hold them out in front of her. Youch! I didn't even put a pin in yet. I know. I just thought that I'd get the yelp out of the way. She was pretty rough with the next pin. Fuck! Almost done. This will be much faster than the slacks. I get the feeling that if Murdoch were here, he'd make a joke about Will putting cuffs on me. So what about you? How's proper work treating you? Well, they're all insane. I suppose that I would be too if I had to weigh peanuts all day. There's just something off about every one of them. I've never met a family so obsessed with appearances. Maybe you can learn a thing or two? What's that supposed to mean? You rely a little too much on natural beauty. More grooming would do you wonders. She cuts the thread off the needle with her teeth. Other arm. I hold it out, stiffly, rolling my eyes. When there isn't some task to perform, there's some person to please. Working here, at least, I know what people want. There, it feels like I'm constantly being tested. So, quit? I think about the fox sitting alone in the dark room. Money's too good. Now there's something relatable. You sound good, though. What do you mean? More focused than you've been in weeks. After I push a little, you push back. So, whatever it is that you're doing over there, it might be helpful. It's because if I'm not on my toes all the time, I get the feeling that something bad could happen. She looks up at me. We're done, by the way. I take a look at my sleeves. They feel right, and they have a good weight on them. And my pants aren't dragging on the floor. You're fast. You have to get fast when you make all your own clothes. You need anything else before I go? No. I mean, you've been a great help. So have you. Now, don't be a stranger. She gave me a small curtsy and left. Oh, and Sam? I hear her voice from the hallway. Yeah? Get out of the suit and hang it up properly with the sheet cast covering it all the way. It's really, really nice. I'll get to it. Getting through the rest of the night wasn't so hard as the rest of the day. My first session doesn't even use up the whole 30 minutes, as much as he needed to let it out. But my second takes up all the time. He has trouble finishing. I'm told that's ordinary as you grow older. He shakes when I stroke him behind the balls, mumbling into a soft moan. Until he pumps it out himself. A bit erratic. And he lies on me to catch his breath. He wants me to pet him before he goes. His skin is soft and it sags beneath the fur. And it's strange how unfamiliar all of the experience in his body is. And how it means nothing to me. Even when I can see every fold and strand of the fur in the light of the moon in pristine clarity. But when he finally gathers his things to leave and leaves his money on the table, I think about Murdoch's body. And I wonder how well I'm remembering it now compared to the next time I see it. My body is tired. And my eyelids feel heavy. The details of my bedroom become too busy to keep track of. And I lose the pictures of them in my head as they're swallowed up by the light of the moon. In my mind, I can see the sky. North. West. South. East. I see celestial lights as far as the eye can see. 
the light of the moon becomes the light of the sun. And it shines through a window. So that's where I'm going to leave it for today. So, yeah. I, I don't know if it was mean for Sam to sort of get Murdoch to accept the fact that perhaps his family is... Are, well, they're terrible people. And... I don't, I don't want to say this about Dahlia, because she seems like the only normal person there, but, like, she seems like she has her head in the clouds. Whereas Holly is the one that's basically using her older brother for... favors. Of the cardinal sense. And... Well, Jim... I wonder if what Sam, you know, talked with him about would... is gonna cause something to happen at the wedding. Which, you know, might reflect badly on Murdoch. No, but... You guys are kind of the ones using him, your son, and your brother for... You know, stuff that you shouldn't. That's weird. And then there's William. And Mr... Well, Alfred uh, Burns... Uh, I assume that having placed a little bit of the suspicion on Nick is going to move some of the suspicion off of Sam, but I wonder if that's going to cause Nick to become the person that gets hanged. Because somebody gets hanged at the end of the story, I think. It's not Sam. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, Sam makes it out of Echo and then moves to the West Coast. I think. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the story turns out differently depending on what you do. But I'm kind of inclined to think that putting suspicion on Nick is going to be trouble for the poor badger. Mm. I guess we're going to have to wait and see what happens further down the line in what I'm hoping is Murdoch's chapter 2 or 3. I forget what chapter it is. Uh, but yeah. So anyways, uh, thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play The Smoke Room yourself, you can find it over on Itch. And uh, if you go to the creator's Twitter page, well, the Echo Project Twitter page, you can find a direct link to the Itch page. And if you would like to support the projects, because there's multiple projects, then you can go over to their Patreon, which you should find a direct link to on the Echo Twitter page, or I'm going to put it down in the description. And you will get early access to all the Echo Project stuff, you know, before anybody else does. Oh, except for me, because I'm subscribed to their Patreon. As well as the Remember the Flowers one. Uh, but yeah. So, I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.